Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Secure the Supply Chain with CIS and Tripwire. I'm Liz Fox, Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All video will stream through the media player. If you'd like to increase the size of the video, you can do so by clicking on the top right-hand corner of the media player widget. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please click on the help widget. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speakers will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webcast at the conclusion of the webinar. So now let's get on with the presentation. We have three great speakers today. Kathleen Moriarty is the Chief Technology Officer at the Center for Internet Security and has over two decades of experience in the industry. Kathleen was named in Cybersecurity Ventures' Top 100 Women Fighting Cybercrime. Among her many accolades and experiences, she is also the author of Transforming Information Security, Optimizing Five Concurrent Trends to Reduce Resource Drain, published last July. Dave Henderson is a Federal Systems Engineer Manager who supports technical pre-post sales in the federal civilian and DOD agency sectors. David started with Tripwire in 2010 and has enjoyed great success in assisting with sales of the Tripwire product line. Tim Erlin is the Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. He's held positions from sales engineer to systems and network administration and is active in, actively involved in the information security community. His contributions include blogging, podcasts, press, speaking, and television. For today's agenda, we'll first hear an overview from Tim. Next, Kathleen will cover how you can apply CIS controls to prevent supply chain attacks. And finally, Dave Henderson will talk about how you can apply CIS controls using Tripwire. Don't forget to stick around for our Q&A session at the end of the event. So now, without further delay, I will pass it over to Tim. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start with um, this slide here. Uh, so uh, we're all very aware of the solar winds or sunburst compromise. Uh, it, it obviously garnered national attention, not, not just inside information security, but also outside of information security, which is uh, you know, indicative of the sort of the size and, and impact of that incident. And we obviously can't have a quote unquote solar winds webinar without a timeline. So I've I've put up a timeline here, uh, just describing the, the overall major events. Um, this timeline, of course, can be filled in with lots and lots of detail, but I, I wanted to illustrate just sort of the big pieces. So among the things that we know is that this attack was fundamentally a supply chain incident, um, meaning that for the victims of the attack, uh, outside of solar winds themselves, they were compromised through their, their, their supply chain and specifically their cybersecurity software supply chain. Uh, attackers compromised the SolarWinds uh, network monitoring software, a platform called Orion, uh, with a backdoor that was then shipped to customers and used ultimately to deploy malware to those end customers. Uh, hundreds of organizations were affected. Um, we don't know all of the organizations that were affected. Um, we do know that the initial compromise occurred back in September of 2019, but was ultimately discovered by FireEye when they were compromised using this same method. So you can see on the timeline, uh, the initial compromise and then the disclosure where FireEye disclosed their compromise, they ultimately quickly after that uh, identified SolarWinds, Microsoft stepped in seizing the command and control domain and uh, US CERT issued an alert. Um, all of that chunk of activity occurred in December of 2020. So very fast there. Uh, this successful attack launched a, a kind of reckoning about supply chain risk. Uh, many organizations just hadn't really considered uh, this type of risk as part of their overall threat model. So today we're going to talk a little bit about solar winds, but more about supply chain risk overall and what you can do about it. And I want to call particular attention to these sort of two outlined boxes on the slide. Uh, the uh, these are the areas where we, we see the most attention paid 
in the industry and in the media today. So these are the exciting parts. Um, the actual discovery of the compromise and the actions that were taken there and the actual compromise of SolarWinds itself. But in this webinar, as we go through uh, our content, I want you to think about this space uh, outlined here between those two points, because this is the area where the controls that you've put in place as an organization can make a difference. Um, when Solar Winds was compromised initially, if they're part of your supply chain, that wasn't something you could do a lot about. By the time that the incident is discovered by someone like FireEye, you're then in an incident response framework uh, or plan, uh, frame of mind. But this space between those two points is where your uh, security controls make a real difference. So consider that as we go through uh, the content here. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen uh, to get started and talk a little bit about CIS. Thank you, Tim, and thank you for the overview on solar winds. And as you noted, it's just one example of many supply chain type attacks. We could prepare just for this one, or we could prepare for supply chain attacks in general. You know, for solar winds, as you mentioned, it was a software update, and that software update was signed, right? So you wouldn't necessarily notice that in your environment. Um, but if you have tight controls and you're monitoring your environments, uh, you have set expected controls and benchmarks on your systems, and you have a better idea of when an anomaly might be occurring. So specific to these types of attacks, I'm just pulling up a, a slide here, um, specific to supply chain type attacks, there are a few things that we can do. Um, we can map to control frameworks like ISO uh, 27001 or NIST security cyber uh, security framework or 853. But within that, how do we decide what to implement? The CIS controls help with just that question. The controls are broken down in terms of the risk to your organization. And there's been recent work done to further prioritize or, or ensure the prioritization of threats uh, being addressed through the controls. And that was with version 7.1 of the controls and uh, version eight improves on that further. And so with the CIS controls, we have now implementation groups. Implementation group one is where every organization should start in terms of providing basic cyber hygiene and not only do we continue to do the consensus-based process to prioritize which controls should be implemented first, our team goes through meticulously mapping those controls into the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and from there into data breach reports like the Verizon data breach report. What this tells us is essentially a validation on the prioritization. And for implementation group one with the 7.1 version, I believe it was about 85% of the risk was reduced from known threats. And that's important because threat actors are continuing to push the needle and we have to respond as well. So tracking what the current percentage of risk reduction is could be important to your board or um, to your budget justification process as you're trying to decide, what do I tackle next? Which controls are, are most important? How can I justify the spend? By providing what that risk reduction is, that should help with the process. And if you're using a larger control framework, then you would map these CIS controls. They, they are mapped into each of the major frameworks and it would just allow you to prioritize what to go after next. And this goes a long way towards supply chain attacks. And if you think about a supply chain attack, you know anyone in your supply chain or partner could be attacked with you know an APT attack. In the case of solar winds, it was developers on the inside. Um, and so if you are holding your partners to a certain level of, of standards, right? So have they also implemented the CIS benchmarks? Are they mapping to a security control framework? How are they managing their systems? And they're, you know, with that, in this particular instance, software updates. 
um, and, and the whole curation process development and DevSecOps, uh, how is that baked into their process? You know, with SolarWinds, we had this, um, this move of the developers to a different country. Now that went pretty much unnoticed and I, I wouldn't expect the next attack to be something along those lines, right? So an insider would be much more subtle because attackers advance. However, if you have solid security uh, practices in place for your own environment, plus those in your supply chain, you're gonna get a bit closer. But this is hard, right? It's, it's not easy to just implement these controls. Um, the CIS you know, prioritization helps, that, that's one piece of this. Another piece that helps is that the controls and benchmarks for CIS and for other um, configuration guidelines like DISA-STIGs are getting integrated into products, right? So the further we push that back up to um, a, a point where it can ease the implementation for every organization, the better. And CIS serves um, the um, state, local, tribal, and territorial communities. So we're very interested to make sure that small organizations are able to manage security in their environment. And, and we're always looking for ways to improve that. And you know, there's a long way to go, but taking these measures should help baking controls into products and then having a way to um, provide continued assurance of those controls. And so some examples of the CIS controls and implementation group one are, are really some of the, the basic things you have to do. Have an inventory of your systems, harden your systems, um, make sure your administrative privileges are limited so some really key and important pieces that you, you need to uh, consider. The CIS benchmarks, if you're not familiar with the benchmarks, you could think of them as the hardening guides that have evolved over time. They continue to evolve with experts in the consensus process, improving them, making sure that the most important measures that you can take bubble up to the top so that you as an implementer have this great way to look and address the biggest threats first. CAS has over 100 benchmarks. And you know if you think of them as hardening guides, that's operating systems, it's applications, it's containers. So you name it, there is you know, a number of benchmarks and they're growing. Um, if your environment is more sophisticated, you should increase and move towards implementation group two and get the added gain out of that um, in terms of risk reduction. And the, for the most secure environments, they should go, at, go after implementation group three. Attackers are very sophisticated. Solar Wind shows us that, um, you know, they're constantly looking for zero day attacks and they're also utilizing day one attacks, known vulnerabilities like the exchange attack that just happened last week, right? So attackers will see there is a new vulnerability. I'm sure not everybody has patched. How can I exploit that? So we have to continue to map our environments to um, a, a higher level in terms of providing security and just understanding what is our base baseline so that we can better detect anomalies. So with that, I'll hand back over. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen. It's always helpful to have someone from CIS with that, that background in understanding the uh, you know, the controls and the benchmarks explain uh, kind of what the difference is, because I think it's pretty easy for um, practitioners to, if you've come to security, maybe from an IT position uh, rather than, than being focused on it, it's easy to, to misunderstand how you should think about, uh, you know, the application of controls versus the application of, of benchmarks. So um, appreciate that explanation. So, Kathleen, just to ask you one question here as we sort of transition um, from, you know, this uh, CIS piece into the how Tripwire can help. Um, for organizations that, that are concerned about their, their compromise through their software supply chain, you know, an organization that hasn't really considered this as part of their, their threat model uh, until now, 
Are there specific CIS controls or specific benchmarks that you think might be most applicable or a place that they should start uh, in that case? If an organization has not thought about supply chain, I guess I would um, begin a dialogue and find out where are they at with their own journey internally before um, figuring out, you know, are they worried about their supply chain? So, you know, their own internal environment, well, what does that look like? Have they started to move to zero trust environments? Are they outsourcing and using multi-cloud? And with their multi-cloud multi selection, how have they made those decisions in terms of you know, who to use for their cloud environment? What kind of controls are implemented? And you know, the tricky part there is that there's lots of different implementations, right? So if you're using multiple cloud scenarios, you have to be up to speed in terms of how do you secure those environments? Um, and then looking to their partners, if they have gone down the road of mapping to security control frameworks, prioritizing which controls you know they implement, providing multi-year budget estimates so that they can continue to reduce their risk, then perhaps they are at a phase where they are also requiring security audits of partners um, or doing the due diligence to figure out is this a good partner? And if it's a, a very large partner, they may have more ability to influence or less ability to influence with a large partner, um, you know, in, in terms of their requirements and a smaller one, you might have more ability to influence. And so what does that mean for your decision process? The larger ones might have more resources towards security and the smaller ones might listen to you more. So, you know, you have to decide what is that balance that's right for whatever your project is and the risk of, of that project to your organization. You know, what data do you have flowing through that? What's exposed? What are the connections? Um, and in those places, that's where you'd be using the CIS controls, right? Because you'd be figuring out where are my assets? How are they protected? Who has access to them? Uh, who has administrative rights to those systems? And so once you do those architecture mappings, um, as you make those decisions with partners and, and vendors, I, I think you'd be a bit more informed you know, toward those decisions. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so as I transition over to Dave Henderson to talk a little bit about how Tripwire can help, just a, a reminder that if you have questions, uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end, and you can enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time, uh, and we'll collect them there. Um, so now's a good time to enter any questions you have for Kathleen, and we'll pick them up at the end when we get to the Q&A section. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dave to talk a little bit about how Tripwire can help. Good afternoon, everybody. At least it's afternoon out here on the East Coast. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for giving us the time to come in and speak with you today. Um, and thanks, Tim, and thanks, Kathleen. Tripwire Enterprise is just one of many tools out there that, um, you know, that IT and security managers have to scratch their heads against and try to make a decision on what's best and uh, what we should be putting in our environment to make sure that we're as secure as possible. And so what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today is one of our products called Tripwire Enterprise and uh, how you could use Tripwire Enterprise to harden your environments and also to monitor for system um, and uh, file integrity across your environments and uh, give you a sense of what kind of value you're gonna get out of this. Now, Tripwire is not limited to the CIS benchmark. We have actually over 900 policies slash OS combinations or benchmarks in our library. And uh, that would include things such as CIS, NIST 853, um, DISA STIGs, as well as you know SOX, HIPAA, um, even MITRE ATT&CK policy. So we go very granular down to the customer level. We even have policies that are specific to organizations such as the Internal Revenue Service. Okay, so how do we do this? What Tripwire Enterprise likes to do is we like to say that, hey, you know what, we're gonna take a snapshot or a baseline of what your environment looks like. And we're gonna capture that data on your endpoints and what their current secure 
uh, posture looks like, and we're going to put that in our database. Okay, so that's called a baseline. We do that by sending out a set of rules to every endpoint that we're monitoring, and then we have an agent. In some cases, it's agentless. Uh, we have a let's say we'll we'll focus on the agent-based system, um, and uh, so that agent then executes what the rule tells it to execute and harvests all the information required from that rule or that set of rules. That data goes back into our backend database and where we have an actual um, set of policy tests, depending on your benchmark, the policy tests are tied to a rule. And so they're dependent on the out output of a rule. And uh, so what the policy test will then do is parse the information that was collected by the rule to determine pass fail on every benchmark and you'll get uh, something like this that you see on the screen here in uh, the Triple Enterprise product. And this is an indication of what a graph might look like for the CIS uh, uh, benchmark results for Linux and for Windows and the trending reports over time. And that time frame can be weekly, daily, quarterly, annually, et cetera. So again, we're baselining the systems, assessing for a compliance state, and then we go through a process of gaining approval to remediate. So if I were to take and click on this one of these graphs here, it would kick open a report that gives me a listing of all the failed or passed tests. And I may be more interested in the failed ones. So I look at those failed tests. And when I look at those, I'm like, well, which of these can I remediate without causing any problems? And of these, of course, these policies or benchmark tests are used to harden your endpoints. So they're very important to get in place. So you take that set of, let's say, failed controls to a change review board and uh, where you have some really smart guys that know that, hey, yeah, we can fix this, we can remediate that, we can do these things, and it's not going to cause any problems in our infrastructure with existing applications, for instance. And so we gain approval, and then we come back to the product and we remediate the uh, failures in the environment. And um, so once we've remediated where it's possible, uh, then we're going to get to a point where we're doing a maintenance state, okay, and maintaining that compliance state over time. And so Tripwire helps you with that by monitoring literally on a daily basis, or it could be, you know, more often than that. It could be every twice a day, three times a day, whatever you want. At least, I would say, best practice at least once a day to monitor my endpoints to make sure that none of those security controls have been modified, changed, removed, deleted, et cetera, okay? Now you are going to run into situations where there are policies uh, that cannot be remediated. In that case, you're going to either put in place some type of a waiver and, um, and that waiver can have an expiration date or it can be a waiver that does not expire. And Tripwire, of course, provides all kinds of reports in addition to some of these you see on the screen here. But we're going to also provide you with waiver reports, scoring reports, scoring reports for the raw score plus the score with waivers. And uh, so we're gonna give you lots of reports. There's over 45 report templates built into the product. Okay, so that's a little bit on compliance, but Regardless of whether we're doing DISA STIGS, NIST 853, HIPAA SOCKS, it doesn't matter what the policy is, the types of reports and dashboards are available for every one of them. And so I'm going to move on to the next slide here and talk a little bit about uh, showing the immediate value. And uh, so you'll see a couple of screenshots over here on the right. One of them is just a clip of several of the policy tests that have failed. And so you get this spreadsheet listing of the date and time I failed the test, what the test was, and you'll see the status over here, it's failed. And then we also provide you with the element, okay? So this element is, is important because lots of times a junior security engineer may not know where to go and fix something. And so this element um, helps them to determine exactly where that policy control is housed. Now in the state case of a Windows system, you may find that 75 or 80% of the policy controls are handled in Active Directory in group policy. And Tripwire Enterprise does give you the ability to monitor Active Directory as well as to monitor group policy for change. Okay? And, and that's very important because like I said, that's where most of the Windows security controls are held. So when I click on that, uh, I'm gonna go back one slide. When I click on this graph here, and I move forward, you're gonna get something like this, okay, for each of the failed tests. And this is going to give me a identification of the test that had failed and uh, the purpose of the test. And this is the immediate part here, the interesting part. This is the remediation guidance, okay? So we're providing you with step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix that specific failed 
security control, okay? So if it requires a lengthy command to run or a script to run, we provide it right here in this report, okay? So this specific report that you're looking at can be emailed to your change review board to get approval on each of the items that have failed, okay? Can also be used to hand off to my system administrative staff or IT staff to actually go and implement the guidance that's listed here to fix the security controls, okay? So that's important, and we'll move on forward here and talk about something uh, beyond that. So let's get back to the, the basics of what we were talking about here today, which was, you know, that big breach that occurred. And um, so we do know that the breach occurred, as Tim had mentioned, in the software development uh, life cycle at uh, SolarWinds. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that's very, 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 I can't even express this, you know, how important it is, is to make sure that in that software development environment that things are not changing, okay? If I'm a software developer and I'm using my tools to create some really cool code and I test it and run it on my own machine, I'm like, this is great. I'm gonna go ahead and pass this on to the next stage. Okay, so you may see that that's in the first stage. The next stage could be a test slash QA type stage and other stages could include staging, release to, you know, to the web um, and general availability, and then maybe into a maintenance stage and that should say RTW, <laughs> that's okay. But anyway, point is that during these phases, we don't wanna see anything deviating from a baseline. So if Tripwire Enterprise is deployed, then I can run a baseline on all my code over here at the beginning of phase one. So while it's in the developers, uh, on the developer system, okay? So I baseline that code. When the developer is ready to move that code to the next stage, let's say to here, then I move it and I run an integrity check, okay? So I wanna make sure that the code that I moved from this phase to this phase did not change, okay? That it's identical, okay? So once I've got that done, then I complete the testing and QA phase, and I may end up having to push it back to development because I may have found bugs or things of that nature in there, get those things fixed. Again, when, we, when that happens, we rebase line or we uh, notice that the changes, when we do the integrity check, that there's several changes and we look at those changes and we approve them. Proving them means we're promoting them. So we're making them part of the baseline. So as that change occurs, we move it back to the next phase, testing, QA is complete. And then it goes from there to the next stage, which like I said, could be released to web or could be out to staging or GA, et cetera. Again, we run an integrity check to make sure the code that moved from test slash QA to general availability did not change, okay? So that's very, very, very critical. Now there is a report in Tripwire Enterprise that's specifically for this purpose, and it's called a reference node variance report. And you see that right here in this second stage here, ref, reference variance check. What that report does is it looks at all of the elements that were baselined over here in the first phase, looks at them in the phase two, it looks at them in phase three, and makes sure that there's no deviation across the phases, okay? So now I've got code that I know is in, in, integral to my infrastructure and the integrity is right where it needs to be. We might call it a gold image and it's sitting out there for my customer base to download and utilize, okay? So that's very important and that's part of, <clears throat> excuse me, and a standard feature in Tripwire Enterprise, okay? So knowing what's going on on the endpoints is extremely critical. So that's file integrity slash system integrity, but there's other components to it and we'll move forward here. And other components might be, um, you know, what? Let's let's just talk. Let's shift gears, and I'll come back to some of those other components in a minute. But when I shift gears here, let's talk about the fact that maybe I'm a customer, maybe I'm somebody that used the product, and so at some point I went and downloaded this bad code, and upgraded my systems. And like everybody has said, it was very hard to detect unless you detected the changes or the integrity in the beginning, it was pretty hard to detect once it got out into the field because the hackers you know, were opening up a door and then they had a back door to get in. And once they got in, they were able to um, assume the identity of the services that were running on the affected, infected um, infrastructure. And they were also able to mimic or um, spoof the users of the product. So if I had 20 different users of my SolarWinds product, then I could take on that identification of any one of those 20 users. So 
what would I do if I had Tripwire installed out in the field and uh, this type of an upgrade, which supposedly was a good upgrade, actually occurred? How could I look to see whether or not I actually had uh, discovered those uh, you know, bad uh, files? So with Tripwire, you can run an element report, okay? An element report would then be populated, the criteria of the report with all of the, would be populated with all of what we call the attributes of the bad files, okay? The known indicators of compromise, essentially the hashes of the bad files. So I could literally, since I've already baselined my infrastructure, I've been a Tripwire customer, let's say for several years, then I could just run a report that looks for those bad hashes in my database without even having to scan my infrastructure to tell me whether or not that data exists. And then I could take action immediately to isolate those endpoints or move that file to quarantine, isolate that endpoint, et cetera. Now, let's say I got through that little check and I didn't find anything in our database, but maybe there's something out on my systems that I hadn't captured, okay? So I didn't have a rule looking for it, let's say. So I can run a rule check across my infrastructure to harvest data around known impacted files, so new data. So let's say that I'm looking for some Windows System 32 DLL files with a specific hash value. I can run a rule check to harvest that data if it does exist, We'll find it, we'll put it into our database, we'll alert your staff, and then we can take a quarantine, isolate action at that point, okay? So let's move forward here and take a look at some of the damage assessment, okay? So what you're looking at here is this is an actual breach captured by Tripwire Enterprise, okay? So what I want, one of the things I want you to note is the time frame. This thing started at 10, 10 a.m. and by 10, 42 a.m., within 30 minutes, my, this, this individual system was completely compromised, okay? So I'm showing you this because Tripwire Enterprise can take action at each stage here to stop this, but I pushed this on through to make sure that we could capture every stage of it so you can see what a breach actually looks like. So in this particular case, the very first thing that was modified is somebody had gotten into the environment and added a new local user rather than a spoofy an existing one. So they created a new local user. Then that new local user added a file called opendoor.cmd to that system. And then he exploded that system, which started up a new process, less service in the background. Now I have a new listening port running. And then um, a few minutes later, we see an established session to that machine and another bad file dropped on the machine, okay? So am I'm looking at this and I'm wanting to find out, hey, is this data all uh, you know, behavioral characteristically, excuse me, behavioral wise is all of this data related. Okay, so the first thing I do is look at that local users and I can click on this link called modification over here and it'll show me a side by side view of what my local users are supposed to look like versus what the new one or what it looks like today, let's say with the new user account exposed, okay? So I can capture that data. And then I also can click on this addition and see the hash data related to this, okay? And all the attribute data related to that new file. Then I can click on this listening ports modification link over here. And I see that a port was, uh, a new port was opened. I'm gonna move to the next screen here just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. In this particular case, this is the actual me clicking on the modification next to the listening port. And you see when I say side-by-side -side view, this is what I'm talking about in Tripwire Enterprise is standard. The baseline is on the left side of the screen. This is what this should look like. The right side of the screen shows that I have a new port 3333 that was added as a result of that opendoor.cmd file being exploded. And then you can see here, actually, this is the established session one, I'm sorry, but we're looking at established session. So I wanna show you the new port 3333, but I also wanna show you the bad guy's IP address coming into the machine session established, okay? So this is a side-by-side -side view, okay? I'm gonna go back to here and just quickly talk about the fact that at this point, I've looked at the listening port. I know that it's 3333. I've looked at the established port. I know that the new connection that's established is in fact 23333. And then I also noticed that this guy, once he's in, had dropped a, a new machine on here, a new file on here called take the system down. So anyway, that's a, a typical breach in progress captured by Tripwire Enterprise. And if there's any questions about that, then we'll be happy to, to answer those here in a bit. 
So let's move forward here. Uh, what else could I do from this damage assessment uh, process? So let's let's think about that for a minute. Um, what about all the users? And so here's the new user, by the way, A. Hatcherman, okay, who was created as the local user. You can see where his privileges were upgraded through these events, and he went in and, and added these particular files to the machine. You'll see that this second last event here that says takedown system that was added to the machine, and you'll see opendoor.cmd was added to the machine. The individual likely in that scenario is not only putting the software on the machine, exploding it, but then taking and uh, like a throwaway cell phone, typing in his buddy over in some other country's address, let's say, and saying, hey, dude, the door is open. So the individual on that end executes the client which is what connects to that service through that port 3333 in this case. And he assumes a username of the individual running the service, a hatcher, okay? So that's what we're seeing here. So what we're looking at is not only can you assess change activity throughout Tripwire Enterprise, but you can also assess the activity of the users that were emulated. So if I took and knew that I had added or upgraded my SolarWinds product, and let's say in the spring of 2020, and I have 20 different SolarWinds users, then I need to look at the activity of those 20 users. I'm not putting them on, you know, getting they're not in any kind of trouble. It's just that their username could have been spoofed. So I look for activity related to all those usernames, and I can do that through a log tool, such as Tripwire Log Center or Splunk or whatever tool, SIM tool you might happen to have in your environment. So moving forward, are there any uh, questions regarding what we just saw, showed there? So Tim, you want to? Um, take yeah. over from there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, so we're we're now entering into the the Q and A portion of the event. Uh, so as I said before, um, feel free to enter questions into the Q and A box, and uh, I will go through them and hand them off, uh, portion them out appropriately. Uh, so there are some questions in there already. Feel free to enter more. Um, I think this one uh, is for you, Kathleen. Uh, I think it goes back to to your section. Uh, the question is: Is there a is there published data backing the 85% correlation? Um, does that ring a bell for your, your section? Uh, yes, that's definitely for my section. And so let's see, in the community defense model document, which should be up on the CIS website, uh, talks about the mappings and reduction, or I'm sorry, so the, the percentages for the mapping to the MITRE attack framework, and so for which is different than than the statistic uh, mentioned before. So I'll, I'll say what is there. Um, it says that of the attack techniques, implementation group one addresses 62% of the attack techniques, and if you implement to implementation group three, you're addressing. 83% of the attack techniques. Now, if you think about attack techniques, um, you can address things like social engineering through training, but you still have the human drivers, the fear, fight, flight, fornication that trigger humans to take actions you know, very quickly. And so you, you can't necessarily mitigate those. And so you will have some remaining risks. Supply chain also is really difficult to completely eliminate. Um, and so I don't have a statistic from in writing that I have found yet, but I will continue to look for that. I'm happy to follow up with um, the, the person asking later to see where it's published that if you, you know, you get to a risk reduction of 85%. It is a number I've heard you know, within CIS a number of times, um, and and that was referring to uh, mapping against today's current threat landscape, which will change, right? So next year's Verizon data breach report and the other breach reports could result in different percentages based on the threat landscape of the times. Well, and maybe just a, a follow up on that, Kathleen. Um, since you mentioned that the threat landscape changes, how how does CIS go about keeping the the controls up to date with that threat landscape? Great question. We have communities of experts, seasoned people who are focused on 
either a benchmark because that's their expertise or focused on the controls. And that community works together to reprioritize the sets of controls. So if you think of something um, like a security guide that comes out from a vendor, it may have every single control or, uh, you know, for a, a, every single, as, as you would say, a policy for a particular benchmark, but the CIS ones will focus on what will reduce your risk the most. That's really interesting because I think um, people who are familiar with CIS at sort of a cursory level may really think of it as a, a set of static controls that they should go work on implementing. But if the prioritization changes with the threat landscape, then it's worth revisiting which of those controls you're prioritizing in your environment based on, on that, that, those changes. That's right. And updates, you know, check for updates to benchmarks. I know um, I was just involved in some updates to Kubernetes. And so those just went back out for consensus review. And, you know, they I, I don't think those changes will have any problem in the consensus process. Um, but these are not static documents. And, you know, our threats and how we understand them change over time. And so does our prioritization. Excellent. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, there is one question in here uh, that um, I think we need a little more clarification on, unless Dave wants to give it give it a shot. The question, as put in, was, "What are the false positive rates on average?" I'm not clear on what that question referred to. So, if you if you are the the asker of that question, please feel free to to enter a, a more specific question if you want a, an answer. But Dave, I don't know if that rings a bell for you from your section, or if there was something to to answer there about false positive rates. Mm -hmm. Well, on uh, Tripwire Enterprise side, a false positive uh, is literally uh, non-existent. Uh, when I think of false positives, I think of something such as a, um, a vulnerability management solution that may be looking uh, for a specific piece of software, some rules that are running against the machine, and it finds that, uh, that there's a breadcrumb of that piece of software still existing on a machine out there, so it's failing. And uh, so the IT team may come back and say, well, that's a false positive, when in reality, when you look at the rule and the data that was actually captured, it's not a false positive because there is a breadcrumb. So even though the IT team may have uninstalled that software, it didn't cleanly uninstall it. So I could see that as being something such as a false positive, but maybe, they'll, uh, maybe we'll get some uh, additional clarification on what uh, Timothy, it looks like, uh, is asking regarding false positive rates. Uh, so with with Tripwire Enterprise in particular, I mean, there, there are a couple things that it detects, right? So it detects misconfigurations, um, in which case uh, I, I think the false positive is is pretty much non-existent because it's it either detects the misconfiguration or it doesn't. Uh, and then detecting changes, I guess that, that could refer to, you had an example in your section about uh, detecting malicious activity, um, but because mm -hmm. we're we're detecting changes, not um, not specifically like malware as a, a presence, the changes associated with it. it. There isn't really a false positive around the change. The change definitely occurred. Is that right? Yes, the change definitely occurred. Sense. And this set of changes actually definitely occurred. It's up to the user of the tool then to open up, uh, like I said, and drill down into each of those changes to determine whether or not the changes are related to each other. So we're not looking for a specific, um, a specific piece of malware based on a .dat file, for instance. We're just saying, hey, behavioral-wise, on this machine, we've seen these six, seven, eight critical changes occur in the last 30 minutes. Are they related? And uh, so we're going to capture that information and give that to you, whether it happens to be uh, a false positive or not. Um, literally, um, if Tripwire Enterprise is picking up the information, then it's in a file that exists on the system, or it is the output from a command that exists on the system. So if I'm looking at, for instance, listening ports, then I may have a command that's actually running a rule that says, hey, run a netstat-an, pipe that to grep or to find string, and look for the word listening, okay? And so I look for that, and then I compare it to what I had baselined, okay? So if I have any difference in that little side-by-side -side viewer, I'm gonna see that, hey, this is a new port because it was not baselined, it did not exist yesterday, it exists today, and it's gonna show up on the 
right side or the second column of that report. So false positives, like I said, if they do exist, uh, they're extremely limited. We've never, we don't have any customers come back to us and even using the terminology false positive as related to Tripwire Enterprise. But I have seen that terminology come around when we're talking about the vulnerability management solution that we have, which is called Tripwire IP360. So there's okay. a related question in here, um, Dave, uh, around the change detection piece, which is how does Tripwire differentiate between, uh, and I'll, I'm interpreting this a little bit, how does Tripwire differentiate between good change and bad change? Okay. So in the context of, let's say, what I showed today in a software development environment, um, Tripwire Enterprise uh, One has a couple of different ways that you can baseline uh, endpoints. So you can either run a... Um, a scheduled task, which runs a baseline at a specific time. You can manually kick off a baseline by selecting a specific node and selecting just the button called baseline in the product, which then executes a baseline. Or I can have a task that kicks off at 2 o'clock in the morning that says, hey, wait a minute, I'm supposed to check for changes on this machine, but my rules are now picking up additional information so that a new additional information is picked up and becomes part of the baseline as long as it's promoted. So there's different ways of doing it, but literally if I'm a developer, let's say, and I've created code and I've compiled that code and I'm ready to pass it to test, okay, I'm going to maybe I send, maybe my process says send a message over to my IT guys or my tri tripwire guys so they can execute a baseline on my system or execute a new baseline. So point is that my code has already been baselined. It's sitting in the tripwire database. That's the considered good. Even if the code's defective, it's still good code, okay? So it goes to the next stage. Once it gets to that next stage and I run an integrity check, I'm running an integrity check on what I received in the next stage versus what was baselined or what's sitting in the database, okay? If they match, we're good. If they mismatch, then we send off alerts and say, hey, wait a minute, this code that was just moved from to the second stage does not match the code that was baselined in the first stage. And uh, so that's how we make sure that our code uh, distinguish between good and bad. Now, we also have the ability to use a product called Tripwire uh, Event Integration Framework, which is a tool that integrates to Red Hat, Remedy, not Red Hat, Remedy, ServiceNow, um, Jira, Check It, different ticketing systems that you may, ha may have employed in your environment. And in that particular case, when a change occurs, then we have the ability to query that ITSM database to determine whether or not there was an approved change, okay? If it was an approved change or an approved activity, we insert a CR number in the actual change data and promote it, okay? So Triple Enterprise keeps a... Um, historical record of every change. So if let's say a piece of code that developer A uh, wrote um, had changed 25 different times, we're gonna see 25 different versions of that code, okay? We're gonna keep a historical record of every change that occurs. And we do the same with security controls as related to CIS or NIST data under 53 or just stigs or any of those. We still keep a, a historical record of every time a policy has or a policy test has failed. So historically, you know, we've got a lot of data sitting in our backend database, but just I hope that answers that question. I, I think you did, yeah, I think you answered it. Um, another question, there are actually two questions here that are very similar, so I'm gonna ask them as, as one question. Uh, and, and it's really about how you can use uh, Tripwire Enterprise in a dynamic environment, like a cloud environment or an elastic environment. Okay. All right, so Tripwire Enterprise has the ability to what we call onboard and offboard uh, virtual machines or cloud components, cloud devices, et cetera. And uh, so the onboarding and offboarding routines are built into the product. So if I have an elastic environment where I'm pushing out virtual machines or let's say containers out into an environment, then Tripwire Enterprise picks those up, onboards them, baselines them, monitors them while they're active, okay? When they become inactive and are pushed back on the shelf, then we offboard them. When I say offboard them, I'm actually saying, hey, this is not, no longer gonna be monitored. We're taking it out of the environment. And as a result, we take the license that was associated with that uh, that particular device or virtual machine, and we put it back into the pool to be used by any others that may be pushed into the environment. Does that answer that question? I think it does. I think it does. Uh, I've got a question for Kathleen here as well. 
Um, Kathleen, can you uh, explain again a little bit the, the relationship of the CIS controls to other industry standards and frameworks? Sure. Um, let's see. So if you take a look at ISO 27001 is one that I've, I've used quite a bit in consulting projects as well as managing um, environments. Uh, I find that one to be, you know, pretty easy to take a look at, although it, if you don't have access to it, 853 from NIST, that's really accessible. So if you go and open up these controls and take a look into it, um, the, uh, I guess not knowing which you have access to, I, I guess I'll dive into 853. There's, I think, over 800 controls in, in that particular document, and they're broken out into control groups. And so, you know, it's every single framework is similar in that there's control groups and underlying controls. The CIS controls has the 20 top level controls, and then there are more detailed ones within that, right? So um, those map into each of these control frameworks, and the CIS ones provides a subset of the controls. So some examples of a, a CIS control, I mentioned before asset management. That's in every single framework. That is a baseline for you know every framework because if you don't know what you have in terms of assets, which could be people, data, systems, then you don't have a starting point. Um, then, let's see, um, understanding you know so some of the the critical ones at the at the very base of the the CIS are you know. Um, having a vulnerability management program. So not only understanding your assets, what software is on your systems, what vulnerabilities are you subject to for the versions, tracking all of that. Um, and I wanna make sure I'm actually getting at the exact question. Uh, so I think uh, the question as, as stated was, um, what's the relationship between, between the CIS controls and other industry standards or frameworks? Uh, right. And I think if I if I interpret that a little, it's a question of you know is CIS a subset or superset? Are they mapped together? Should I focus on one or the other? That kind of thing. Right. So CIS maps into each of these. Um, it is a subset. It is not comprehensive to the degree that some of these others, like um, you know NIST eight hundred fifty three, is the most comprehensive. It's the most detailed. However, if you look at over eight hundred different things to do, you're overwhelmed. And so CIS controls are a really great starting point um, and also a way to prioritize. So even if you, you've you been implementing against ISO or, um, or NIST and you're trying to figure out what do I do next, the CIS controls could help you to figure out how do I reduce my risk the most by looking at this prioritized set that you know has been mapped against attack techniques and known and exploited threats over the past year, right? So looking at, you know, things like the Verizon date, data breach report. The other um, reports that are, I'm sorry, the other frameworks are great. They're holistic. They carry through in time. However, you don't get this prioritization in terms of risk reduction. So they are complementary. And the CIS ones help you to know what should I do next? That's great. Thank you, Kathleen. I think uh, we have time for a, a couple more questions, uh, and there probably will be a couple left over that we don't get to just looking at the list here. Um, so one question here uh, for Dave. Um, you mentioned baselines. Uh, why are they so important? Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. From a file integrity slash system integrity perspective, a baseline provides you a reference point to assess a change against, okay? So if I have, for instance, a um, a change to a, a security control such as the slash etc slash login.def's file or login definitions file on a Linux machine, and that's where I control all my passwords, okay? And all of my uh, password setup and, uh, you know, warning ages, expiration dates, et cetera. So if somebody goes in and I baseline that file, okay? And then the next day or next week or next month, somebody goes in and modifies that file. If all I'm doing is looking at change from the point of view of a 
log system, let's say, that says such and such changed such and such file, then without that baseline, I have no reference to compare it against. Okay, so the baseline is extremely important for comparison reasons. Now, I just did two and one there. Okay, I chose a security control, which is captured by CIS and NIST and DIS and all of them called login.definitions, but that's also a file, okay? So in the tripwire world, not only is that a reference point for my security controls and what my security controls look like when I initially baseline the machine, uh, but also, you know, what the security controls or the files look like when I initially baseline the machine. So the other part from a compliance perspective is that a baseline provides me with a score. So I may run a baseline of my policy rules or my benchmark rules, okay, for CIS on a set of Windows machines, and the average score may come back at, you know, 43% compliant, okay? So I know that I am only 43% compliant. I've got a lot of failed security controls, okay? So uh, the majority of those, let's say, are Windows machines. So I'm going to likely end up going over to my Active Directory guys and uh, adjusting group policy and doing a GP update to get those scores up. But once that happens, I run a new report, okay? My new report says now my compliance is up to 76%, okay? It's up to 76%, but I can compare that through trending to show that when I initially baseline the machine, I was at 43%, now I'm at 76. I'm gonna to continue to work my way up to 85, 90% compliant and get secure. So I have that historical trend analysis, which we know that all managers and uh, director or executive level individuals love to see. So baselines are extremely important for reference. Another, from an operational perspective, okay? I used to work on an operational help desk at a huge ISP. And um, so if I had a, um, you know, let's say a Cisco router that was baselined out in, San, you know, let's say in Palo Alto, California, and, um, so all of a sudden I'm getting reports into the operations center that um, I can no longer connect to devices in, uh, let's say San Jose or San Francisco. And so I go and look at those baselines or I run those checks against those Cisco routers to see what's changed. And I might find that there's a routing loop going on, okay? And I know that because I have a reference of the running config and now I have a a change in the running config showing that somebody's changed my route data, okay, so I can see exactly what changed. From an operational perspective, I can easily put that system back into the working baseline state and solve the problem, okay? Yeah. That's great, Dave. Thank you so much. Uh, and I was wrong. We had time for one more question. So um, we're out of time. I think there are just a couple of questions that we didn't get to answer. Uh, here, so we'll try and follow up on those uh, with uh, those individuals after the fact. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Liz to close us out. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'd like to thank Kathleen, Dave, and Tim for a great event, and thank you to our audience for attending. We hope you found the presentation informative and useful to you. If you'd like to receive proof of attendance, please respond to the follow-up email that you receive at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts. You can check out our schedules at tripwire.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.